Amen. Amen. Well, good evening. 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 Doesn't feel like evening after this time change, does it? It's pretty sunny out there. All right, let's please stand. Welcome to Brian Baptist Church and turn in your hymnal to page 363 at Calvary. Please stand and join, sing together. At Calvary, we'll sing the first and the fourth. Amen. <clears throat> Years I spent in vanity and pride, caring not my Lord was crucified, knowing not it was for me he died on Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free, pardon there was multiplied to me. There my burdened soul found liberty at Calvary. On the fourth, oh, the love that drew salvation's plan. Oh, the grace that brought it down to man. Oh, the mighty gulf that God did span at Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free. Pardon there was multiplied to me. There my burdened soul found liberty at Calvary. Woo, good singing to start off tonight, and I believe we can say praise God for Calvary. Amen. Amen. I believe that's why you can sing it. Uh, as you do. Well, you know, our crowd's not that large, but you sound like the building's full. Amen. Amen. You really do. Boy, and that's a great song this time of year as we center our attention around the resurrection. I know we serve a resurrected Christ 24-7, seven days a week, uh, four weeks a month, 12 months a year. But I'm glad. The reason I like these holidays, as for me anyway, I know that they've, they've polluted them, they've ruined them, uh, they've turned them into something that they're not, but I'll tell you one thing, they can't change. Christmas is still the celebration of the birth of Jesus Christ. Amen. And I don't care what they do about it, they can't change that. And Easter, or we'll use that term, Easter is still not chickens and eggs and bunnies, but Easter is still a celebration, and they can't change it, of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. You know, they, uh, they can call it spring break and all that garbage uh, there. No, no. It's more than that. It's more than that. I wish the world would wake up to it myself. Amen. I really do. But anyway, that's, that's my little uh, tidbit for tonight. I'm glad you're here. Appreciate it. Before I, we pray, I, I want to say something I, I meant to do this morning, and I get excited and get my mind on a hundred things, and I, I get past one, I forgot what I'm supposed to say. Amen. <laughs> laugh, some of you. You're not much better, I'll tell you. <laughs> I'll tell you that. But uh, the beautiful flowers and arrangements, isn't, isn't it beautiful this year? Amen. Amen. Michelle and Tony. And then the beautiful, I don't know what you call it, Merle or, or uh, a picture up there. Terry makes those personally. And that's, that's a beautiful. Now, she's not feeling well tonight. I didn't know whether they'd be back here tonight or not. But anyway, in case you're not noticing these things, I guess some of you are. But I tell you. They add a lot, and I think that's beautiful, amen? amen. And I think these, these decorations, I was wondering, hoping and praying, uh, I'm so glad for that. I was wondering if we are going to have any lilies or anything like that this year, and Michelle took care of it, and we sure do, amen. amen. Beautiful. I mean, it really is. I thank God for it. Amen. Glad to be here tonight, amen? amen. 
I guess I'm just excited about what I think God's going to do for us. And I praise the Lord. Father, we love you. We thank you and praise you. God, <clears throat> thank God tonight. Thank God tonight. We don't just have a religion. We serve a risen Christ. He's alive. He's alive. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise God. It's not just a, 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 a national uh, celebration day. It's not Easter, particularly. It's more than that. And I'm so glad we, as God's people, know what it's all about. Amen. Amen. Father, we thank you for that. Thank you for these who are here tonight. Pray for those that are listening in uh, by the stream. God, that you would uh, speak to their hearts tonight through what Brother Aaron's going to preach tonight. And I pray, God, that you would uh, bless the message. Uh, give us the message God wants us to have, something that will uplift us and, and strengthen us. And God, thank you for the service this morning. What a blessed service it was. And I thank you for that. Not, my, by, not by my preaching, but by the Spirit of God. I believe he was here today. And I ask you to bless even again tonight. And we'll give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 You going to sing one more? Or you gonna... Let's just go. Just go. Let's All right. Go. You may be seated. Let's go. I'm in the mood to preach, not sing. I'm sorry. I'm not a, I'm not a singer, and obviously, if you listen to us online at all. I don't want to scare any more people away. The preaching does that enough. Turn in your Bibles to the little book of Jonah, one of the minor prophets in your Old Testament. Little book of Jonah. I was talking to my cousin on the way in, and he said, I, he said, do you want me to call you after church? And I said, sure, what time? He said, I don't know, somewhere around 7.30. I said, you guys go till 7.30? He said, oh, yeah. And I thought, boy, I need to remind pastor 7.15 is too early. Just kidding. I'll t the little book of Jonah. I'm still trying to figure out why chickens are bad, but, you know, I know the Easter bunny and all that stuff, but I'm not against any chicken at all. <laughs> I don't care. <laughs> you can have chicken seven days a week as far as I'm concerned. Little book of Jonah. <clears throat> We're going to read the first few verses out of Jonah chapter number one. Jonah chapter number one, starting in verse number one. The Bible reads, Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord, and went down to Joppa, and he found a ship, among, uh, a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare thereof and went down into it to go with them unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord sent out a great wind into the sea, and there was a mighty tempest in the sea, so that the ship was like to be broken. Then the mariners were afraid and cried every man unto his God, and cast forth the wares that were in the ship unto the sea to lighten it of them. But Jonah was gone down into the sides of the ship, and he lay and was fast asleep. So the shipmaster came to him and said unto him, unto him What meanest thou, O sleeper? Arise, call upon thy God, if so be that God will think upon us that we perish not. And they said every one to his fellow, Come and let us cast lots that we may know for whose cause this evil is upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell upon Jonah. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you for everything that you've given us as a nation, as a people. Lord, I ask now that it would be your Holy Spirit tonight. Lord, I ask that your Holy Spirit would move among the members here tonight. Lord, I also ask that it would move among those that are online listening tonight. Lord, I, I wish many in our leadership would listen to this as well. Many around Washington, D.C., and many of the capitals around the world, they need to hear what God has to say. 
we can no longer free for, uh, flee from the presence of the Lord. Lord, I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Came up with the title on my sermon tonight, Why Send Jonah? Why Send Jonah? And as I was reading the Bible, um, I started thinking about, you know, the type of ministry that Jonah had. And I, had, I came up with a few questions. Why would guy, God ever use a guy like Jonah? Why would God ever use someone that's trying to get away from him? Why would God want to pick a man like that, right? That's a fair question to ask. Why? Why? Why, God? Someone that's trying to run from you, why would you want that guy? Also, can God get a hold of you and use you? See, that was kind of how I answered that first question was, God can use each one of us, right? Amen. God can get a hold of us and use us, even though we try to run from the presence of the Lord. But that's not the main question here tonight that I had. Sometimes guys like this, and now, now with women being out there giving out the gospel and trying to make a difference in our nation and around the world, sometimes God has to use people that are like this. But for the context tonight, as far as preachers and those speaking the word of God from the pulpits, sometimes God has to use a man like this because he knows in his heart, according to the word of God, what's coming. And truthfully, that's my burden tonight. And this is why I pray that many in America who are in leadership positions would listen to a sermon like this or around the world. Why? Because I believe this is a warning cry because what comes next, the cry that comes next might be a final cry. So let's go ahead and cry now while we can. Cry out to the Lord and tell them what the word of the Lord is because we have the word of God. But the number one, there were a few things that troubled me about Jonah in his ministry. Number one is he tried to flee from the Lord. We saw that in chapter number one. And another thing about Jonah that really bothered me was his disappointment in how God actually worked. Look at chapter number four quickly before I hone in on my one point that I'll have tonight. Look at chapter number four. Well, let, let chapter three, verse 10, the last verse kind of leads in to chapter number four. I want you to notice this in verse number 10. And God saw their works that they turned from their evil way and God repented of the evil that he had said that he would do unto them and he did it not. You know, if God threw out a bunch of warnings, the average Christian in here tonight, if God gave that loved one of yours a second chance, boy, you should leap for joy, right? You know, there's a lot of times that, you know, people that we thought never would get saved or would never come back around to God, and maybe we were mad at them. Maybe they wronged us in, wronged us in the past, and they get right with God, and then that bro they become a better brother in Christ. We would be happy for them, right? But one of the things about Jonah's ministry was this. When people got right with God, he was still miserable about it. He wasn't happy at all, was he? Let's read. Verse number one of chapter four. You know, God doesn't pour out his wrath, but it displeased Jonah exceedingly. And he was very angry. Let me tell you something right now. There's a lot of people that I'm angry with. But let me tell you something right now. If they got right with God and we made some real changes in this nation, I'd be willing to forgive, wouldn't you? I'd be willing to welcome many of them in and say, come on, you just didn't know. You were lost. You didn't know what God's will was for your life, but now you do, and now you've turned. I wouldn't be exceedingly disappointed like Jonah was. This is one of the things that bothered me about his ministry, right? And he prayed unto the Lord and said, I pray thee, O Lord, was not this my saying when I was yet in my country? Therefore I fled before unto Tarshish. For I knew that thou art a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness and repentest thee of the evil. You know, <clears throat> that really bothers me as a Christian. It bothers me that that's the kind of preacher Jonah needed to be. Wait a minute, needed to be. Let's continue. Therefore now, O Lord, take I beseech thee my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. Then said the Lord, doest thou well to be angry? 
So Jonah went out of the city and sat on, on the east side of the city and there made him a booth and sat under it in the shadow till he might see what would become of the city. And the Lord God prepared a gourd and made it to come up over Jonah that it might be a shadow over his head to deliver him from his grief. So Jonah was exceedingly glad of the gourd, but God prepared a worm when the morning rose the next day and it smote the gourd that was withered and it came to pass when the sun did rise that God prepared a vehement east wind and the sun beat upon the, the head of Jonah that he fainted and wished in himself to die and said, it is better for me to die than to live. And God said to Jonah, doest thou well to be angry for the gourd? And he said, I do well to be angry even unto death. Then said the Lord, thou hast had pity on the gourd for the which thou hast not labored, neither madest it grow, which came up in a night and perished in a night. And should not I spare Nineveh, that great city, wherein are more than six score thousand persons that cannot discern between their right hand and their left hand, and also much cattle. You see a very disgruntled Christian here. You see someone who could have had a great testimony of a ministry, and you say, well, how, how is this beneficial? Well, as I was studying, chapter 3, I believe, holds the answer to this. Because I'll tell you right now, there was a time in America when there were a lot of preachers that preached like Jonah did. And they had somewhat of an edge to them. But too many people in America and around the world said, I didn't want that kind of preaching anymore. I don't want the kind of preaching that causes me to move to repent. I don't want that kind of preaching. And there were a lot of uh, preachers in the heyday of fundamentalism that were just like Jonah. Were there not? There were. They wouldn't let people back into church even when they got right with God. Did you know that? There were a lot of the hardcore preachers that they wanted to see a little bit more than just a change of mouth or a change of opinion. They wanted to see the change of heart. They wouldn't just welcome you back in. There was some hard preaching then. There were some hard people then too. And you say, you know what? Why? Why, it, why would it sometimes be necessary? I'm going to get to the point here in a second. But look at chapter number three. Chapter number three, I believe, holds the key. Chapter number three. This was the hardest part of his ministry that I had trouble understanding. Verse number one, And the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. Number one, God has a certain way he wants Jonah to preach. And many of those preachers back then, God was moving with the inspiration of the Holy Spirit for them to preach a certain way. You say, well, what way is that? Just wait. So Jonah arose and went into Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceeding great city of three days journey. And Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey, and he cried and said, yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Boy, that is probably one of the shortest sermons I have ever heard. Yet 40 days and America is going to be overthrown. What would happen if someone came out and yelled that today? It'd be a little too little too late at this point, don't you think? But what, and as I was beginning to go through the word of God, and I'm looking at these passages, that's exactly what God wanted a man like Jonah to preach. And it took a man that maybe wouldn't be as forgiving, and God knew the type of man he was. God knew what kind of stance he would take and how hard he was, but it sometimes takes that kind of person to deliver that kind of message, does it not? Unfortunately, this is why I believe God sent Jonah. Like I believe years ago, he sent many of the hardcore fundamentalist preachers of that day. That makes sense, right? Yet 40 days in America could be destroyed if we legalize abortion. Right? How many preachers, how many sermons from the 1960s going into the 70s when the abortion movement picked up? How many of you can remember the types of sermons where the men of God would get up and say, hey, if we do and we go against children and we slaughter them, America's going to be destroyed? How many would say that? Almost all of them. And you know what? You know how many people in America are laughing at those guys right now? They, don't, they didn't take them serious. It's been 37 years, 38 years since abortion was legalized. 1963, when they legalized and 
allowed homosexuality to be now in the open where before it was not. How many preachers, fundamental preachers, said, yet in 90 days or 40 days, Nineveh would be destroyed or America would be destroyed? As in the days of Sodom and Gomorrah, as in the days of Lot. And they all turned and said, 40 days has passed, my friend, and nothing's happened. Right? And this kind of preaching was relevant. Why did God send Jonah? And i got to ask a question today. Why are there no more preachers like him out there? There's very few. And then when someone stands up and preaches hard, people say, man, I haven't heard anything like that in a long time. You know why? Because the sugar cane, ice cream sandwich sermons that have been preached the last 30 years have destroyed America. Destroyed it. I know what we preach out of the Bible here at Berean Baptist Church is not popular. I know it doesn't even come across friendly. But wait a minute. I'm rubbing salt on a wound. I'm not trying to make you feel good. I'm trying to get you to get right with God. Because one of the main things that Jonah's ministry did was get people to repent and turn from their sin and get right with God. And that's what hard preaching should do. Shouldn't, you know... He didn't get up there and go into the entire Bible like we have the luxury today. He walked up and down the street and said, in 40 days, it's done. It's over. You don't get another chance. And I feel like that's why Jonah cut his message short. He was almost happy. You ever think of that? But get this, verse number five, so the people of Nineveh believed God. Huh. Huh. And proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them even to the least of them. For word came unto the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, and he laid his his robe from him and covered him with sackcloth and sat in ashes. You think that's going to happen today? It ain't going to happen today. You know why? Because we're past the preaching of Jonah. Did you know that? We're past it. So why send Jonah? We're past the preaching of Jonah now. Do you really think Joe Biden's going to take off his suit coat and he's going to put shave his head bald and sit in sackcloth and ashes? No. But I'll go a step further and say, I don't think there's any president out here who would. Not a one. Right? Because if they would, they would have by now. Wait until the end of the fourth quarter to try to jump in the game. If you're going to do right, do it now. When you have an entire Supreme Court that's conservative and you've done nothing to fly in the face of abortion, you're guilty before God. Every one of them. Every one of them. And you say, well, wait a minute. No, you wait a minute. It ain't a popular message. And most Christian conservatives would say, well, what message are you sending? I'm telling you right now, where's Jonah? Why is there not a preacher like Jonah anymore? And I truly believe that God is past that final stage because in the Bible it says there, the shedding of innocent blood, God will not pardon it. He will not pardon it. 63 million children slaughtered. Many of the stem cells put in your vaccine for COVID. No, it's, we got conservatives. I don't care who you say you are. You ain't changed it, you ain't conservative. You ain't changed it, you ain't Christian. You've believed the lie. And that's the God's honest truth. You want to know why Jonah's not walking up and down the streets of America anymore? Because not only is he not popular, nobody listened to him. Nobody listened to what he had to say. Why? Because 38 years ago, America didn't get destroyed. 40 years ago, America, 50 years ago, 20 years ago, 10 years ago, America didn't get destroyed. Do not mistake God's patience for tolerance. Turn to 2 Kings chapter number 14. 2 Kings chapter 14.
2 Kings chapter number 14, verse number 23. In the 15th year of Amaziah, the son of Joash, king of Judah, Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel, began to reign in Samaria and reigned 40 and 1 years. And he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. He departed not from all the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nabat, who made Israel to sin. He restored the coast of Israel from the entering of Hamath unto the sea of the plain, according to the word of the Lord God of Israel, which he spake by the hand of his servant, Jonah, the son of Amittiah, the prophet, which was of Gath Hefer. For the Lord saw the affliction of Israel, that it was very bitter, for there was not any shut up, nor any left, nor any helper for Israel. God was down to one man to try to get the message out. One man to try to turn the tide. And I haven't seen a guy like that stand up in a long time. See, there was the moral majority in the 1980s that stood up and flew in the face of that evil crowd, but you don't see it much today. It's a wishy-washy conglomerate of a bunch of guys who don't make a stance or take a stance for anything. Oh, yeah, in one breath they'll say, don't do abortion, and in the other they'll say, it's okay to drink alcohol, just have a little. One, one way they'll say, don't, don't, don't accept the homosexual marriage, but in, then turn around and say, it's okay to rack up some debt. You know, out of one mouth, they'll say the worst of the worst things is the worst, but you can dabble a little bit over here. There isn't a stance among any of them like there was back then. They didn't just make one stance, they made many and took many stances. And then today you don't see that being taken anywhere. There are very few pastors and preachers and evangelists that will make a stance, a strong stance clear across the board and say, thus saith the word of the Lord. And there's no compromise when it comes to this book. But they're all compromising. They're all compromising. See, I believe the reason why we don't see a lot of Jonas today is because some preachers are sent to convert. Does that make sense? Some are sent to convert. Some are sent to get people to convert before God's destruction comes. But you know the Bible's loaded with a lot of other preachers? Hard preachers. Do you know what they're sent for? They're sent right before the condemnation of God comes. There's a whole group of them. There's a whole bunch of them. Turn in your Bible to the little book of Nahum, which from Jonah would be right a few chapters. It would be Jonah, Micah, Nahum. Some are sent to convert, but there's a whole group of preachers in this word that are sent to confirm the judgment of God. Look, I'm not trying to be down tonight. This ought to move us to repentance. This ought to move us to take some action. Why? Because I have kids. You have kids. I have a grandkid. You have grandkids. And what we do and how we live and how we act affects what kind of life they could or could not have. See, the book of Nahum is a totally different type of prophet. Why did God send Jonah? To avoid sending a guy like this. God sent a guy like Jonah that wasn't compassionate and everybody said, oh, they're just hard preaching back in the fundamental movement. Oh, those old Bible preachers, oh, they didn't have any love at all. Yeah, they had as much love as Jonah did, but it kept you from sin, did it not? Should have scared you straight. But yet the problem is, is you didn't look at it like that. People didn't look at it like that. They went off with this whole evangelical, wimpy movement of a bunch of men wearing skinny jeans and loafers and talking fancy with some slick back hair, looking really cool, and, and talking with a slick tongue. And everybody followed that movement because they were so nice. Right? That's what happened. Hey, you know what? When I sing up here, the music program's terrible. It is when I sing up here because I can't carry a tune on my back. But that doesn't mean I'm going to pull in a bunch of drums and guitars and all kinds of stuff and have a bunch of half-naked women up here singing. That ain't going to happen, not on my watch Amen. or pastor's watch. I'm not going to compromise. I'm not going to come along to get along. <clears throat> so God had to send because... 
You know what? The book of Nahum takes place. It's the same scenario. It's the city of Nineveh. But now there's a different preacher coming. The first preacher came and there was repentance. And I believe there was great repentance in the United States of America. People tried to get right with God for a long time. They really pushed, pulled. God, during 9-11, many people went back to church. But that didn't last. About three months at best. At best. So here we are today. Same exact place. But now the prophet of destruction comes. Verse number one, the burden of Nineveh, the book of the vision of Nahum, the Ecclesite. God is jealous. You know how many times I've heard people say, oh, you shouldn't be jealous. Wait a minute. God's jealous. Matter of fact, if you find him throughout the Old Testament, he even, is, he even says his name is jealous. I am the Lord thy God, my name is jealous. What's that mean? He don't want you committing fornication or adultery with any other God. He demands he's your God. Right? His name is God. He's jealous. But yet so many of us in America have put so many other things in front of our God, right? Look, I'm just going to be real with you tonight. Unless some things and some changes are made in America, I don't want to be the prophet of destruction. I don't want to be the preacher telling you what's coming not far down the road. But look, I can't help it. I can't even sleep hardly anymore over it because I'm watching the destruction of my nation and I'm watching my kids and my granddaughter and I'm looking at everything going on in the world. Every time I go out to go to the grocery store or I go out to the restaurant or I go anywhere and I see all this fear and I see all this wickedness and all the stuff that's going on in America and I can't help and I can't help but to see what's going on and it tears me apart and I'm just going to be honest with you tonight I'm not taking it out on you I'm just telling you what I see what the Bible says this is what it says this isn't my opinion God is jealous and the Lord revengeth the Lord revengeth and is furious the Lord will take vengeance on his adversaries and he reserveth wrath for his enemies how many enemies in America and around the world do you think the Lord has now? Right? I mean, look, how many enemies, how many people hate the Lord? See, this is what happened when the preacher of Jonah fails. This is what happens when the guys like Jonah get everybody to get back to the Lord and there's a great revival and there's all these bus ministries at Landmark Baptist Church, First Baptist of Hammond, Akron Baptist Temple, you know, uh, uh, Temple University, all these great big fundamental institutions where all these churches got on fire in the 1970s and 80s serving the Lord and then by the mid-90s they start falling apart. Compromise. There was a great revival, and then it starts falling apart. You want to you know why? Because people resented the preaching of Jonah after a long time. They said, you know what? God, God hasn't done anything. He hasn't judged America. I'm just going to stay home on Wednesday night, now Sunday night. and Heck, I won't even go to church on Sunday. I'll have church in my living room. It ain't church in your living room, I'm sorry. Now, you can worship the Lord in your living room. You can watch preaching in your living room. But don't deceive yourself. It ain't church. Because church is a called out assembly of believers. Right? How can you assemble by yourself in your television? I'm there in spirit. No, you're not. No, you're not. Look, eating chips in your Old Navy pajamas is not you being in church. That's you watching others in church. Now, granted, look, I'm not against anybody watching us online. I, look, I love it. But that's not church. It's not. And that's why we got to be careful, too, because many of these large churches have preachers that aren't even there anymore. They have remote preachers, and they have people gathering. Wait a minute. Is that what the Bible said? Oh, no, but he's a good speaker. Is that what the Bible said? Does he need to be a good speaker? God can use people who aren't so eloquent right verse number three the lord is slow to anger and great in power and will not at all acquit the wicked the lord 
have his way in the whirlwind and in the storm and in the clouds or the dust of his feet. He rebuketh the sea and maketh it dry and drieth up all the rivers, Bashan languisheth, and Caramel and the flower of Lebanon languisheth. The mountains quake at him and the hills melt and the earth is burned at his presence. Yea, the world and all that dwell therein. Who can stand before his indignation? And I'll tell you right now, you see the same thought in Revelation chapter number six when Jesus returns. You see the same thought in 2 Peter chapter 3 when he said the day, the day of the Lord comes as a thief when the elements melt with a fervent heat. You saw a glimpse of it when Jesus was on the boat with his disciples and he got up and he caused the storm to stop. And they said, what manner of man is this? Even the waves obey him. Right? Amen. That's how you know Jesus is the Lord in the Old Testament and the New Testament. Because the whole thing testifies of him. And who can abide in the fierceness of his anger? His fury is poured out like fire, and the rocks are thrown down by him. The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knoweth them that trust in him. See? God knows who trusts in him. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not unto your own understanding, and all thy ways acknowledge him. He'll direct your paths. Depart from evil and do good. Nobody quotes that last verse, do they? Depart from evil and do good. Repent. Turn back to the Lord. See, I'm on the fence here. Because part of me says maybe we're not too far past the preaching of Jonah. Maybe we're not into the book of Nahum yet. Maybe we haven't quite gone over the cliff yet. Maybe we have. But I'm going to fight like we haven't. I'm going to keep on going on like we haven't. But I'll tell you what, I'm scared because I do know what is coming. I do. Because the Bible doesn't lie. Amen. God's true. And as a Christian, we can see the signs, right? And I'm not wanting to throw my hands up and say, oh, good, it's almost over. Let's go. I want to fight to the very end because I have people I love that aren't saved yet. They don't know the Lord. And if I were to go in the rapture or death, there's a really good chance they may never know the Lord. Because who else would be able to talk to some of them? You can't count on the preacher, the Sunday school teacher, the whoever, to go talk to others about Jesus that you come in contact with. It has to be you. You're the only one. And I sure hope I sure hope we're not past this point. Scoot on, scoot on down to verse number 10. For while they be folded together as thorns, and while they are drunken as drunkards, they shall be devoured as stubble fully dry. There is one come out of thee that imagineth evil against the Lord, a wicked counselor. You know, we see a lot of that today, right? A lot of wicked counsel, a lot of wicked counselors. But let me tell you something. There's coming the wickedest counselor of all time to deceive humanity. And let me tell you something right now. When that guy does show up, many of the people that you think are, oh, you know, they're going to come across a Bible and they're going to get saved. Don't you, don't you leave their soul to that? That snowball's chance? Don't you, don't you leave it. Why? Because not only is that guy going to come with all signs and lying wonders, but God himself will stand a strong delusion. Why? Because they love not the truth that they might be saved. So I'll tell you right now, we got to fight. We got to push forward. Why send a guy like Jonah? Why send the unloving or seems to be unloving preacher? And maybe he is edgy. Maybe he actually didn't even like these people. Look, I've been at churches where I don't even think the pastor liked the people there. <laughs> Who else has been to a church like that? Who thinks it's this church? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but it's true, right? You think, my gosh, that's all. You know, I, I can remember growing up and, you know, when you're younger, you're like, whoa, boy, the preacher really got hot and bothered today, didn't he? And it's like, does he even like us? The truth of the matter is he loves you. Why? Because he, the Bible says obey them have the, that have the rule over you. And why is that? 
because they watch for your souls as one that must give an account. That they may do it with joy and not with sorrow or grief, for that is unprofitable for you. Right? And you think to yourself, boy, that preacher, he just seems to keep coming down on me. Thank God for a preacher like that who's not afraid to tell you what's wrong. But what are you going to do with it? Are you just going to push it off to the side and just continue on? Chapter number three. Chapter number three. Here's the prophecy. And I'll tell you what, when I was reading this the other day, I mean, there is such a comparison to America. Verse number one, woe to the bloody city. Woe to the bloody city. Christian, we need to stand up against what's going on and just not satisfy for a bunch of talk. We need to be moved to action. America's become a very bloody city. Well, it says city. That doesn't mean the whole nation. Well, every nation has a capital. So let's talk to Washington, that bloody city, who with the stroke of a pen has slaughtered millions of babies. With the stroke of a pen has allowed many that have killed people to live on death row far too long. You know, I heard somebody say this. Hey, you know what? Maybe we should go to being able to carry guns, right? Maybe we should be able to carry them openly, or maybe not because we don't want to be like the wild, wild west, right? See, here's the problem with that kind of ludicrous talk. If you want to be like the wild, wild west, then I'm all for it. Well, then let's live like the wild, wild west. Let's go behind the courthouse, build gallows, and when somebody is caught abusing a child, they're hung. They're tried and hung. When someone takes somebody's life and they get a fair trial, they don't go to the prison. When they're found guilty, they go to the gallows. Like the wild, wild west, right? When someone just rises up and smites his neighbor, by man's blood shall that blood be required of you. If you want to go wild, wild west, let's go. Because that would be a pretty good deterrent, would it not? Instead, they want to give him a lollipop and stick him in prison for 30 years. In time out. I can't believe you'd say that. Bible said it, not me. You take a life, you pay. Well, that's the Old Testament. Show me a difference. Show me a difference in the New Testament to the Old Testament. Jesus, Paul, Peter, every one of them spoke more in the, in the New Testament of the Old Testament than anything else. Why? Because it still mattered. The only difference is the death of the testator, Jesus. We now know who he is. It's revealed. But there's no difference. And you say, well, oh, I don't believe you. I believe Chucky Swindoll. He says there's a difference. Well, then let me ask you a question during the millennial reign of Christ. What law does he rule with as he rules with a rod of iron? The Old Testament? The New Testament? How about both testaments? Because he is the absolute authority and his word stands at all times. But you're not going to be taught that. You're not going to be told that in America. You're going to be told, hey, here's a slap on the wrist, a timeout a detention, you lose your iPhone for a week, and now you can go on your way, and you'll get it all back. Woe to the bloody city, Washington, D.C. It is all full of lies and robbery. The prey departeth not. You know, does that not sound like Washington, D.C.? Lies? Oh, my gosh. It's like I'm reading to you out of the Washington Post. Only this is the word of God. I'm reading to you what's going on in Washington, D.C., you bloody city. Supreme Court. Let me, I'm going to say this right now. You can believe the fairy tale, the lie from Fox News all day long if that's what you want to believe. Go ahead. Believe it the rest of your life. As America goes on a bobsled to hell, go ahead and follow the fairy tale. But the truth is right here. With the stroke of a pen, they can end it and they won't. The Supreme Court can end it tonight and they won't. Why won't they? Because they're liars and they're murderers. And they're in there and they don't care and it's a life position. Look, if I don't do well at my job, I'm canned. When they're doing bad at their job, well, it's for life. Can them. Who in the world said that's the way it's got to be? 
Don't go changing things. Let me tell you something right now. You're going to let babies get murdered all the time? Can them. Can them. This would have never stood 100 years ago in the United States of America. Wouldn't have even been a thought. Quit believing television. Quit believing a lie. You're believing the lies. And those lies are going to cause the prophet Nahum to pop up everywhere in the United States to say, here comes the judgment of God. People used to laugh at me. You believe America's Babylon? Show me another country in the entire world that's killed as many babies, has as much wealth, commits as much adultery, produces enough pornography, has as much homosexuality, has enough wickedness in all the movies and the, the uh, exuberant amounts of violence and all the wickedness, all the debauchery leading the world in every kind of wickedness around the world. And now people are starting to say, you know, you might have a point to that. You read Revelation 18 a few times. Did you tell me who you think America is going to become? Well, they're not in Bible prophecy. Who said that? You didn't read this book. Because I'll tell you right now, this time, Nineveh was Babylon. Nineveh was the seat of power in the world. The Assyrians, the second world power behind the Egyptians. I'll tell you what, Bible prophecy unfolds today. Show me another nation as wicked as you. What about the Muslims? Yeah, what about them? They're wicked, right? Islam's a wicked religion, straight from hell, right? But is the entire Islam community living in wealth? Would all the shipmasters from every quarter say, wow, when, when all of the Middle East is destroyed, who's going to buy our goods anymore? Their own people keep them in such poverty, they don't have anything. Antichrist ain't coming out of Islam. That's the dumbest thing I ever heard, and it's unbiblical. Rome is no longer the seat of power in the world, period. We need to wake up. Who's the bloody city today? Show me a bloodier nation than America and what it's become. 63 million babies and putting their stem cells in Johnson & Johnson's vaccine. you got to be kidding me. I want to save this nation. I don't want to continue to be a part of its destruction. I want to turn it around. Because it's starting to line right up with everything that's wrong in the Bible. Number two, the noise of a whip and the noise of the rattling of the wheels and of the prancing horses and of the jumping chariots, the horsemen lifting up both the bright sword and the glittering spear. And there is a multitude of slain and a great number of carcasses, and there is none, none end of their corpses. They stumble upon their corpses because of the multitude of the whoredoms of the well-favored harlot, the mistress of witchcrafts that selleth nations through her whoredoms and families through her witchcrafts. Look, I, I mean, I, I remember a time when people used to freak out over Harry Potter. Now it's, they show it in churches. Tell you what, Revelation 8, 8, 8, chapter 18 says, and the nations were deceived by her sorceries. Hollywood, movies, movies. They're not even normal movies. You know, I can remember a time in America where it was like, wow, that was a really good, you know, family-oriented. Family-oriented? You don't see any of that anymore. None. Why? Because they baited you in, got you addicted, and keep pushing it in. Keep pushing it in. And they keep changing the script. And what used to be funny isn't funny. Now the most vile, wicked stuff is hilarious. Not to me. Not to me. A movie ain't even a, you know, you got the old cowboy movies when the guy gets shot and he's like, oh, and he falls down. Now a movie like that, it's like, pfft. That guy's got to get ground up into a million pieces. Blood has to be splattered everywhere for me to enjoy it. Why? We've become so desensitized. So desensitized to what's going on. The music alone. The wickedness in the, I mean, it's not even music. No, no, America's the good guy. You know what? What happens when the good guy's no longer the good guy? I mean, Egypt, they were the good guy once, right? 
Joseph went down into Egypt, became second in command in Egypt, saved the entire nation. They weren't the bad guy. And then all of a sudden arose a king that knew not Joseph. Guess what? They're the bad guy. How about Nebuchadnezzar? Babylon. I mean, he was a messed up guy. But he still gave Daniel, Shadrach, and Meshach, and Abednego an opportunity once God proved them. And then, you know, he had his ups and downs, but his son was ten times worse. His son was ten times worse. So much so that God had to bring the Medo-Persians in and wipe them out in one night. And I'm not saying Babylon was the good guy. I'm not saying Egypt was necessarily the good guy. What I'm saying is, is these nations turned overnight. And America used to be the good guy. And I know there's probably people out here tonight that think I'm crazy. There's probably people out here tonight that are mad at me in their heart saying that, you know what? Maybe what you don't like America. No, I love America. I love it enough to stand up here and tell you what it's becoming. I'm not afraid to tell you because I actually care, because I actually love people to the point that I want there to be a, a real difference, not chitter chatter and talk. I'm so sick of hearing everybody talk. Talk is cheap. Anybody can do it. It's cheap. It's like Pastor this morning talking about it. Say it with your mouth. I don't see a difference. <clears throat> Verse number five, Behold, I am against thee, saith the Lord of hosts, and I will discover thy skirts upon thy face, and I will show the nations thy nakedness and the kingdoms thy shame, and I will cast abominable filth upon thee and make thee vile, and I will set thee as a gazing stock. What's that mean? Bad example. <laughs> there were, I'm just telling you right now, I don't, well, I don't even have to. T I don't even want to get into it. And and it shall come to pass that all they that look upon thee shall flee from thee and say, Nineveh is laid waste. Who will bemoan her? When shall I seek comforters for thee? Art thou better than a populace? No. That was situate among the rivers that had the waters round about it, whose rampant part was the sea, and her wall was from the sea. Just like America. You know how many presidents have got up there and said, let's cut the military program down. We don't have any enemies in Canada, and Mexico doesn't pose a threat, and we have all this water be between us. I sit alone. I sit a queen. No sorrow will come to me. How many a world leader has said that? How many American presidents have said it? Barack Obama, George W. Bush said it too. Little did he know someone would take some of his own airplanes and run them into buildings. Right? Look, when God wants to judge a nation, he's going to judge it. There's only one thing that can keep God's judgment back in this nation. And I'm telling you this, and I'll tell you why, because I can't hardly sleep. I'm getting four hours of sleep a night, and I'll tell you why, because I keep waking up, keep thinking I'm hearing things, keep thinking things are going wrong, keep wondering when God's going to judge America. Keep thinking to myself, when's it going to happen, God? Because I can go out to dinner on a Friday night thinking the world's going to get a little bit better. You take your family out, you try to have a good time, and you think, boy, we better get there early or we better show up late because there's going to be a crowd, and there's hundreds of seats in the restaurant open. And you think, what's going on? This time of year, you should have to wait an hour or two, right? But wait a minute. And you go out to the store and everybody's got a mask on. Everybody's scared to death. Everybody looks at you because you don't have one on. Right? And you wonder, what's going on? And you think, are things ever going to go back to being normal again? Are we ever going to get another chance? Let me ask you a question. Do we deserve another chance? Honestly, if you're true with yourself, maybe you personally may deserve another chance. But as a nation, how many chances do you think we deserve? Why don't you stop and think and pray and ask God to reveal to you how many chances you think America should have? 
Why don't you go home tonight, skip dinner, get on your knees and say, God, show me the kind of visions, kind of thoughts, kind of things from the word of God that you're showing Brother Aaron. And I'll tell you what, your perspective might start to change and you might be moved to some real action. Because I'll tell you right now, I sure wish God would start sending Jonah because I know at least with Jonah, we got a chance because when he starts sending Nahum, there's no chance. Because Nahum's telling you what's getting ready to happen right then. And Jonah's saying, in 40 days, you're going to be destroyed. Nahum's saying, here it comes. Jonah warned you years ago. 612 B.C., the prophecy gets fulfilled. And God destroys Nineveh. Do you care about America? Do you care about your family? Do you care about the lost? I'm going to skip to the end. Go back to chapter number one of Nahum. Nahum one, I mean Nahum chapter one, verse number fifteen. I'm telling you what. I, I don't want to be involved in the generation that's known as the falling away to you. You go to heaven and, and everybody in heaven, Moses is like, oh yeah, I know you. I watched you from heaven. Wherefore, seeing we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let's lay aside every weight and the sin that does so easily beset us and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Right? Moses is up there and says, oh, I know you. You're one, you're one from that group, the falling away group. What group's 2 Thessalonians chapter 2? That group. Oh, you mean that group? The group before the Antichrist is revealed? The group of failures? I don't want to be known as that group. Do you? You want to go up to heaven being known as the part of that's in that group? I mean, I don't. I, I, would, have rather, I would have rather been born years and years ago and gone in with the group that preached righteousness. And taught the word of God. And been known as that, going in with that group. It's like being inducted into the Bible Hall of Fame. What group do you want to be associated with? The greats of all time or the guy that they settled for when there was no one else to select and said, yeah, during the falling away, he wasn't half bad. He didn't strive for excellence. He just strived for mediocrity and he just slid right on in as far as, as, as Christianity goes with his good work. Verse number 15, Behold upon the mountains the feet of him that bringeth good tidings, that publisheth peace. O Judah, keep thy solemn feast, perform thy vows, for the wicked shall no more pass through thee. He is utterly cut off. You want to know why God can put this in this very, very destructive book? Because see, at this time, Israel is divided into two kingdoms. Nine and a half of the tribes are in the northern kingdom, settled in Samaria. And Judah, Benjamin, and a half of the Levites, and during the king Hezekiah's reign, and Josiah, when they find the book of the Lord, they say, come on down here. And some of the ones leave up there all the idolatry, and they come down into Judah, Judea, where Jesus ends up coming, and they come down there. Why? Because the gospel's being preached down there, the solemn feast. What do you mean? They were keeping the feast? That's how they were going to heaven? No, they kept it in their heart. They knew what it represented. They kept the Sabbath because they knew it represented the rest that they're going to have from their enemies. Well, how do you know that? Turn to Isaiah. Isaiah 52. Go left in your Bible. Isaiah 52. Verse number 5. Isaiah 52. Verse number 5. Left in your Bible. I'm just going to start reading because I don't want to go till 7.30. No, actually, I'd like to go till 9.30, but I think everybody would leave. <laughs> Verse number five, Now therefore, what have I here, saith the Lord, that my people is taken away for naught? They that rule over them make them the how, saith the Lord. And my name continually, every day, is blasphemed. Oh my gosh. How many times are you hearing it? Oh. Oh, I mean, 
that every time someone takes the name of the Lord thy God in vain, it ought to cut you in the heart. You ought to feel a dagger thrust through your chest. And every day it's blasphemed. Therefore my people shall know my name. Therefore they shall know in that day that I am he that does behold. It is I. We get this, verse number seven. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that bringeth good tidings, that publish peace, and bringeth good tidings of good, that publish salvation, that saith unto Zion, thy God reigneth. Thy watchmen shall lift up the voice. With the voice together shall they sing, for they shall see eye to eye when the Lord shall bring again Zion. Hey, you know what? Break forth into joy. Sing together. Right? You think maybe God's trying to give us a hint on what we should do? Maybe we should start publishing the gospel? In these dark, dying days... Nahum was, said, Nahum was told, hey, look, there's still a group of you down in Judea. I'm not going to let the wicked mess with them, and I'm not going to destroy them. Get the gospel out. Publish it. Good tidings. Same exact thing. Publish the gospel. Turn to Romans. Romans chapter number 10. Let's see if the Bible's consistent. Romans chapter number 10. Quit blaspheming God. Verse number 11 of Romans 10 says, For the scripture saith, Whoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Quit blaspheming him. Believe on him. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord all, over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe on him on whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. From the very beginning, God had a plan. Give out the gospel, the good news, the glad tidings. Get people saved. And once you get them saved, get them cleaned. Once they get cleaned up, then you live right. Because it matters. Your blessings, how God deals with you, how God deals with the nation. Look, I love life. I hope to live to be 110 years old. Seriously. People say, really? Falling apart? I want to fall. I want to fall apart. I want to get so old that I'm just, I gotta, I'm falling complete. Why? I love life. I like looking at the trees. I like it when it rains. I like it when the wind blows. I like it when I hear and see my granddaughter smile and laugh. I like talking to my kids, don't you? I like talking to my parents, don't you, if you can, right? I love people. I love my life. I want it to be long. I want you to have a long life. But it's in our hands, Christians. It's up to us to get out the gospel. It's the only thing, and it's always been the only thing that keeps God's judgment from taking place. Look, the Bible says God does not have pleasure in the death of the wicked. He's not willing that any should perish, but all come to repentance, right? I would love to see another couple Jonas come before I see a Nahum come. Because I want to live a long life here on earth. And I want to know that when I go, my kids can live a long life too. And I want to teach them to enjoy the neat things in life, the precious things in life, the things that matter. I mean, you've heard the term stop and smell the roses. When's the last time you actually have? Right? I mean, when's the last time you slowed down and enjoyed your life and the things that are out there in the world? You know, people always say the Christian doesn't have any fun. Look, the Christian has the most fun. The most fun. I have the most fun in my life. I get up every day before the sun gets up. I thank God that he gave me a job. 
I thank God for the aches and pains I have. It lets me know I'm alive. And I'm, and I'm not still asleep. I like to drink a cup of coffee, don't you? Or two. I like McDonald's breakfast, don't you? There's things that I love about life. And I don't want it to end anytime soon. And I don't want God to judge America anytime soon. But if we don't really make some changes, Christians, and we don't start doing some things differently, these things are going to go away. They've already started. We've already started losing a lot of them. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the examples that are in it. Lord, I just ask that you would have patience with us. I know you do. Lord, just give us open doors to give people the gospel. And if there's one in here or two or all of us, Lord, sometimes I get afraid to talk to someone about you the way I should. Lord, give us the right words to say. Let it be your Holy Spirit. Lord, I just ask that you give us the opportunity to save people. To make a real difference. I don't want it to be the end. Lord, I just know there has to be one one day. Because your word said it. But just like at the preaching of Jonah, there was a long time in which you didn't judge. And Nineveh was always a bloody city. Bloody from its inception. A warmongering, hateful people that destroyed, but yet you gave them an opportunity when the preaching of God fell upon them. And Lord, I just ask, please, one more shot of you turning the hearts of the leadership of this nation, the leadership of this world. I know the devil's out there, and he's going to go about, and he's going to try to tear down nations and kill. He's a liar. He's a murderer. But he's always been that, and he hates us. But Lord, I just ask that you would help us to stand strong in this time, and that you would help us to have the opportunity to give the gospel and the and the strength to do it and not to be afraid. Lord, I ask that you bless this church, put a hedge of protection around it, a hedge of protection around its members. Lord, I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.